Thank you. That concludes topical questions. The next item of business is a statement by Shona Robeson on autumn statement, Scottish Government priorities. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions uh, at the end of her statement. Therefore, there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on Shona Robeson, Cabinet Secretary, around 10 minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Uh, tomorrow, the Chancellor of the Exchequer will make his autumn statement setting out the UK Government's budgetary plans for 2024-25. The actions taken in his statement will largely set the context for our budget on the 19th of December. The disappointing reality is that the amount Scotland has to spend on services is still largely driven by a Westminster wedded to even deep, deeper austerity. That means that while I will announce our budget in 28 days' time, I still don't know the quantum of funding available to support Scotland's needs. We're only a little over a year on from the disastrous Trust Mini budget that turbocharged the cost of living crisis, inflicting misery on individuals, communities and businesses. We've now seen 14 increases to interest rates and stubbornly high inflation. Even with the recent reduction in inflation, prices are still around 15% higher than at the start of last year. Inflation remains more than double the Bank of England's target rate. The Resolution Foundation expect the current UK parliamentary term to be the worst for living standards since the 1950s. Tomorrow, the Chancellor needs to recognise this and change course. Presiding officer, our public finances have continued to face significant challenges from inflation. Brexit, the war in Ukraine, the increased costs of public sector pay and a capital budget that does not come close to what is required. Despite these challenges, I'm pleased that the Auditor General last week gave the Scottish Government's accounts for 22-23 an unqualified audit opinion, this for the 18th year running. This year, we have prioritised public services and delivered fair pay deals for our public sector workers, but these come at a cost, and we must deliver a balanced budget. Pay deals added an estimated £1.26 billion to our recurring pay costs in 2023-24, and £1.75 billion across the public sector. This was around £800 million above the amount budgeted for 2023-24. We have worked to try and mitigate the impact of Westminster austerity, but without a change in course from Westminster, I fear we are now at the limits of what is possible to mitigate within the powers of devolution. I have today written to the Finance and Public Administration Committee to outline the measures that I have taken to ensure these costs can be met in this financial year. These have been exceptionally difficult decisions, but they have been necessary to protect services where they are needed the most. In total, savings and funding prioritisation of £680 million have been required in year, with £284 million already being expressed in the autumn budget revision and the remaining £396 million that will be set out in the spring budget revision. Of those, £391 million are resource and £289 million capital. These reductions have included £10.5 million from the Future Transport Fund, £30 million from the Energy Industries Capital Programme savings delivered by the Scottish Funding Council, including £46 million from the withdrawal of the Strategic Change Transformation Fund, as communicated in May. £3 million from, the, uh, from Efficiencies in Marine Scotland, £28 million from agricultural budgets with a commitment to return this funding in future years. And we'll also redeploy £6 million held in reserves by Forestry Land Scotland, with that funding to also be returned in future years. Further details are included in the letter to the Finance and Public Administration Committee, which was provided to opposition business managers prior to this statement. Furthermore, as inflationary pressures continue to exacerbate the cost of living crisis and pressures for households and businesses across Scotland, I have protected overall health spending and our investment in key programmes such as the Scottish Child Payment and in tripling the fuel insecurity fund for this financial year. This challenge is as a result of prolonged Westminster austerity and is not unique to Scotland. Last month, the Welsh Government set out that they needed to find £600 million in savings before the end of the financial year. Accounting for different differences in the size of our budgets, that would be the equivalent to over £1 billion for Scotland. The devolved administrations have worked together to call on the UK Government for additional funding and in-year budget flexibilities to support the management of the pressures we all face. 
The response so far to these calls has been, at best, insufficient. Presiding officer, I am developing our budget for 2024-25, guided by our three missions of equality, community and opportunity and the Beat House Agreement. In doing so, I will be reflecting on the feedback from committees following the pre-budget scrutiny process. When I presented the medium-term financial strategy in part to Parliament in May, I laid out the scale of the challenge that we face. I showed in May that our central resource spending outlook for 2024-25 was one billion higher than our central funding scenario, which was based on the Scottish Fiscal Commission's forecasts at that time. Our funding for capital projects is facing a real terms cut next year. We must meet these challenges in the 2024-25 budget. The decisions we make must be underpinned by reform to ensure that people in Scotland get value from the taxes they pay and secure a sustainable future for our public services. The Auditor General for Scotland raised the importance last week of reforming our public services to ensure they remain financially sustainable in the long term. We are committed to public service reform that will help deliver fiscally sustainable public services which improve outcomes and reduce inequalities. The powers that this Parliament needs to deliver a better budget for Scotland are still retained in Westminster. The Chancellor needs to act tomorrow to deliver for investment in public services and infrastructure, to prioritise net zero and tackling fuel insecurity, and to supporting people with the ongoing cost of living crisis. I've written to him to stress the importance of these areas. Uh, from briefing to the media in recent days, it appears that this may not be the course that he follows, with suggestions that tax cuts may be prioritised over investment in public services. Bluntly, when Westminster consistently underinvests in public services, it means we have less funding to spend on our public services in Scotland. As I've set out, these concerns are shared by other devolved governments. The Welsh Finance Minister and I both raised the need for increased funding to address this with the UK Government directly. This is especially important for infrastructure investment. However, our budget for capital investment is constrained by the UK Government spending decisions, with funding projected to fall in real terms by 6.7% between 23-24 and 27-28, and potentially more given sustained inflation. And this, of course, limits our ability to deliver projects at the required pace. So I've called on the Chancellor to rectify this. this mu there, must, there must be new money and not funding that we've already allocated to other commitments. This happened with the UK Government's recent announcement in response to our request for additional funding to support flood recovery, which was disingenuous to say the least. A key part of this is ensuring that there is the necessary investment in the infrastructure that we need to meet our net zero targets and realise the opportunities for jobs and the economy. That should include confirming a decision on the ACORN carbon capture and storage project, where we have pressed the UK Government repeatedly on this and where we need to see action. And providing an appropriate market mechanism for hydropower, the lack of action from the UK Government is preventing Scotland from fully realising its potential. It is also unacceptable in a country as energy rich as Scotland that around 830,000 households, 33% of all households, are in fuel poverty. And although the energy price cap has dropped, many consumers are still paying significantly more than they were two years ago. With Gillian Martin, I've called for a social tariff for priority consumers, as well as reinstating the £400 energy bill support scheme. The UK Government must also take longer term action to reform the electricity market so that everyone benefits from the net zero transition. We can all see that the pain, the pain that the cost of living crisis is causing. We are using our social security powers to deliver a system built on dignity, fairness and respect. And this year, we're investing 5.3 billion in the Scottish Government's benefits and payments, which will reach around 1.2 million people, including our unique Scottish Child Payment. However, the majority of social security spend in Scotland remains reserved to the UK Government. I've called on the Chancellor to increase working age benefits by inflation to ensure that they retain their real terms value for struggling families across the UK. I also urge him to go further and legislate for an essentials guarantee which pro would provide those who need it most with the most basic of necessities and benefit 8.8 million families. This would provide dignity and security for people reliant on universal credit. 
and have again called upon the UK Government to remove the heinous rape clause, the two-child cap and the benefit cap, which disproportionately affect women and children. Presiding officer, I have been frank with members about the challenges we face and the difficult decisions that we have had to take to balance our budget and make best use of public money. We are doing all that we can within the limited powers that we have, but we need the UK Government to step up and use its powers for the benefit of Scotland. The priority for any fiscal headroom should be investment in public services. Tomorrow, the Chancellor has the opportunity to make a real difference for people across Scotland, and I urge him to take it. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues uh, raised in her statement. I intend to allow up to 20 minutes, after which we'll need to move on to the next item of business. And I invite members who wish to ask a question who haven't done, already done so to press the request to speak buttons. And I first call Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I was going to begin by complimenting the Cabinet Secretary, who I thought was very gracious at the Finance Committee this morning when she acknowledged that through the fiscal framework discussions, uh, relationships between the Scottish Government and the UK Government uh, had been uh, very uh, convivial, and that is a good sign. This statement, however, completely undermines that, because it's a category of negativity that is blaming the Westminster, is blaming Scottish Government, um, sorry, blaming Westminster for everything that has gone wrong in the Scottish Government. Now, I want to ask the Cabinet Secretary three things. Cabinet Secretary was right when she said in her recent letter to the Chancellor that businesses in Scotland have faced seriously, serious challenges in recent years. So can I ask her then why in last year's budget the Scottish Government refused to pass on the same rates relief that their counterparts in England and Wales received, yeah. something that was called for by virtually the entire business community in order to stimulate economic growth and protect their competitiveness. Secondly, she cites tourism and hospitality as facing particular challenges, but does she accept that one of the biggest challenges that they are facing is entirely one of the Scottish Government's own making when it comes to the unworkable policy on short-term short lets? And when she talks about public services, will she finally acknowledge that one of the biggest difficulties they face is a result of the crippling SNP cuts to local government funding over a sustained period of time? Cabinet Secretary. So um, I described uh, the discussions I'd had with the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, John Glenn, as a bit of an oasis in a desert, just to be precise. The desert being the rest of the UK government in terms of the difficult uh, relationship we have in uh, making uh, ourselves heard and getting them to take on board uh, the needs uh, of, of Scotland's public services. The negativity, well, I'm sorry, but there's a lot to be negative yeah. about choices that are going to face us are going to be largely set by the choices of the UK government tomorrow. And what I said in my statement was that they should prioritise public services. And then Liz Smith, in her final remark, talked about local government funding and seemed to therefore agree with me that the Chancellor should therefore prioritise public service funding. So I hope that she will stand with me if the Chancellor does not do that tomorrow and instead prioritises tax cuts for the better off over public sector funding, that she will be equally criticising him for that choice. In terms of business support, we have, of course, uh, agree, agree, agreed and supported for many years the number one ask of business and that is to freeze uh, the poundage and we will of course come to our conclusions about business support as we take forward the budget discussions over the next few weeks. Daniel Johnson. I, I thank for advance sight of this statement. After 16 years of Conservative government we've had 16 years of short-term thinking, poor transparency and poor sustainability. And it's little wonder, therefore, that the le letter that the D DFM wrote was such. But is the Scottish Government not making many of the same mistakes? On transparency, she rightly asked about how the mooted fiscal changes will be paid for, but how will the council tax freeze be paid for, or will local authorities be asked to fit the bill? On long-term planning, the Fiscal Commission is clear there's a £2 billion hole, but where is the plan to address this? And on growth, there are cuts being made to infrastructure such as ports and motorways that this not undermine the growth and the growth in incomes that we need to gain extra money through the fiscal framework that's so badly needed. Cabinet Secretary. As I set out in my statement, 
these same challenges that the Scottish Government is facing are exactly the same challenges being faced by the Welsh yep. Labour Government, exactly. who say exactly the same thing, that the issue is the UK Government's lack of financial flexibility, the quantum uh, delivered for public services in Scotland and in Wales. So there's no nothing exceptional about the Scottish Government's position here. It is exactly the same as the Welsh Government and indeed the Northern Irish uh, public services are facing the same problem as well. In terms of transparency, I don't think anyone could criticise me for not laying out the scale of the problem here in the letter to the Finance uh, Committee. It lays out exactly what we've had, the difficult decisions we've had to take to balance our budget in 2023-24 and indicates the even greater challenge uh, next year should additional resources not uh, be coming to the Scottish Government given the impact of inflation and all of the other uh, impacts that I laid out in my statement. In terms of the fiscal sustainability, absolutely, and I will lay out in the budget the steps that we are taking. The Auditor General uh, has uh, challenged us to do that as well. And when I set out in the MTFS the scale of the problem uh, for next year and beyond, I was very clear that there are measures we had to take ourselves, not least in uh, terms of public service reform. But let's not be about the bush here. The Chancellor tomorrow could solve the issues that both Wales and Scotland are facing by making sure the priority is public services funding. I would hope that the Labour Party would support us in that. And if they don't, Thank I think that Chief will speak Cabinet volumes. Secretary. Um, Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Murdo Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Deputy First Minister, Scotland's budget process, including scrutiny of the draft budget, is heavily constrained by a timetable effectively imposed by the Chancellor of the Exchequer and the imposition of one-year settlements. Given that no detail of the Chancellor's autumn statement is provided in advance, what difficulties does that present in relation to preparing Scotland's draft budget, particularly during this cost of living crisis when it's so crucial to protect Scotland's public services and invest in infrastructure to build a fairer, more equal and prosperous Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, Kenny Gibson makes a very important point that the lateness of the autumn statement is uh, particularly difficult to plan for Scotland's 2024-25 budget this year. Um, the budget process is complex to develop and it's reliant on forecasts from the OBR and the Scottish Fiscal Commission to finalise the tax and social security policies alongside portfolio spending plans. We'll always endeavour to produce a Scottish budget at the earliest opportunity for the Parliament, but um, the complexity and risks now embedded in developing the Scottish budget and its forecasts mean that a late UK autumn statement represents a particular challenge to this. Murdo Fraser to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Does the Scottish Government support an ongoing freeze of fuel duty? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we have set out our priorities in the letter uh, to the Chancellor in terms of our priorities. And what the priorities I have set out today very clearly is that the resources available to the Chancellor tomorrow should go on funding public services, not on tax cuts for the better off like inheritance tax and support for bankers' bonuses. Those are our priorities. It's for the Tories in here to set out theirs. Okay. Let, let's listen to the questions and the answers. I call John Mason to be followed by Rhoda Grant. The Cabinet Secretary talks about uh, tax cuts. And can she say, does she think that uh, if there were to be tax cuts tomorrow uh, from Westminster, that it would be the poorer that would suffer most or the richer that would suffer most? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we've had no engagement from the UK government on their plans uh, to cut taxes. All we've seen is the briefing uh, to the media. Uh, so we don't know uh, where those uh, tax cuts will land, how they will be funded, who they're targeted at. So at this stage, it's very uh, difficult uh, to say. The track record of this Tory government suggests that the poorest in our society are unlikely to be the ones who benefit most from any of their policies. We'll set out our tax plans in the budget on the 19th of December. Rhoda Grant to be followed by Stuart McMillan. The Scottish Government are reading budgets to compensate for their financial mismanagement, budgets that are essential to meeting our net zero ter yep. targets. They're also kicking the can down the road as to when they'll repay the farmers their missing millions. Can I ask 
what impact these budget cuts are going to have in meeting our net zero targets, and when will farmers get their missing millions? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I wonder if Rhoda Grant was sitting uh, in the Welsh Assembly, whether she would have said the same to her Welsh Labour government colleagues, who have had to announce the same type of in-year spending reductions because of the very same pressures on our budget. So there's no difference here. We have set out our priorities. None of these decisions have been easy. In terms of the agriculture uh, reductions that I set out, I said in my statement that those will be returned uh, to the budget and we'll do that in a way that aligns with the spending profile uh, of those budgets. So I'm very uh, happy to set that out. I'll be meeting with the um, NFUS uh, tomorrow to have further discussions about that. But I would hope that Labour, instead of blaming uh, the Scottish Government, would actually join with us in pointing the finger, as their Welsh Assembly colleagues have done, where it should be pointed, and that is at the UK Tory Government. Exactly. Hugh McMillan to be followed by Alex Cole Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Presiding Officer, our capital and revenue budgets have been cut uh, from the Westminster Parliament, uh, thus affecting what can be invested in other adverse effects including inflation and cost of borrowing are there, in addition to now RAC, which is added onto that list. So what confirmation from the UK Government has the Scottish Government received with regards to the capital and resource budgets? And will they at least increase with inflation to try to protect investment that the Scottish Government is attempting to do? Cabinet Secretary. So we've had no confirmation from the UK Government that budgets will increase in line uh, with inflation. Uh, the funding that we have received from the UK Government has not matched the, the scale of the, the challenge that we currently face, with inflation, of course, eroding our uh, spending power. Uh, and whilst we're using the levers at our disposal, this does hinder our response to the current economic turmoil that we face. And the, the cut to capital uh, is particularly uh, difficult because we want to make the investments that we want to make but with that real terms uh, cut to capital <coughs> budgets for the foreseeable future that will have a major impact I will set out at the Scottish budget our um, infrastructure investment plan going forward uh, but there is no doubt that will have a, a huge impact uh, on our infrastructure here in Scotland and in turn uh, our ability to grow the Scottish economy which of course is helped by that infrastructure investment. Alex Cole-Hamilton to be followed by Emma Hart. 